So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Oliver Kirsebaum and I'm the senior and staff scientist on the Meridian project. And on behalf of the Meridian team, I'd like to welcome you to this seventh and also the last webinar in a series of uh, webinars that we have been hosting this winter. Um, so a little bit of background about Meridian. Um, Meridian is a three-year project uh, funded by the Canada Foundation uh, for Innovation. And we also receive support from the member universities, which include Dalhousie, Université de Québec, SFU, UBC, and UVic. And we also have a number of industry partners, uh, notably JASCO and Exact Earth. And this webinar series in particular is funded by a grant from uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada uh, through the Ocean and Freshwater Science Contribution Program. I would also like to uh, thank Pisces Research Project Management uh, for their help with preparing and running this webinar series. At Meridian, our mandate uh, the last few years has been to support the ocean research community through the creation of software tools for managing, analyzing, and visualizing underwater acoustics data. Uh, and so as part of this webinar series, uh, we have been showcasing some of the tools that we've created in the last couple of years. And uh, also today, we will be showcasing the tool that we are working on. Um, so today's webinar deals with uh, detection range modeling for acoustic telemetry, um, understanding how the detection range uh, varies under changing environmental conditions is a challenging problem of importance uh, for deploying, uh, for deployment planning and also for analysis of telemetry data. Um, and so to help uh, researchers in this field to establish uh, a model of detection performance, that works in uh, the marine environment specific to their study. Meridian um, has been working together with uh, the Ocean Tracking Network, OTN, to develop a workflow and provide a set of open source tools um, that combine detection data with environmental variables uh, to support uh, visual analysis and hypothesis generation. So today uh, we have John Pai from OTN uh, and Steven Bergner from Meridian SFU uh, who will present the results of this ongoing project. Um, John will start by giving a general introduction to acoustic telemetry and afterwards we'll have Steven uh, go into more detail about the software that he and his team at SFU have been developing. Um, and after each of these presentations, there will be time for questions, uh, which you can ask either by uh, unmuting yourself after the presentation is over, or you can use the chat. Um, also, I should just mention that the webinar is being recorded and the video will be made available uh, through Meridian's YouTube channel uh, within the next week or so. And on our YouTube channel, you can also find recordings of previous webinars. And so without further ado, let me pass the mic to you, John, uh, for the first presentation. So feel free to share your screen. Sounds good. So I am John Pai, I'm currently Director of Data Operations for the Ocean Tracking Network. Um, we're here to give a little background on acoustic telemetry, uh, range testing, and why we care about it and what kind of questions we can answer with it. So uh, here we go. So OTN is a global infrastructure network funded by the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. We're headquartered at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We've been operating since 2008, uh, deploying thousands of acoustic listening stations and other cutting edge ocean monitoring equipment in key locations along with our partners around the world, uh, some of which are here. Uh, we've established partnerships with this global community of regional and national stakeholders to document the movement of aquatic animals in a changing ocean. The knowledge that's collected by our researchers has been useful to policymakers, industry, indigenous and coastal communities, and to the general public. Uh, so at the OTN data shop, we manage all sorts of tagging data, uh, satellite data, radio, soon we'll be handling RFID as well. Um, but the biggest holding we have and one of our most important jobs at the data shop is to quality control and cross-reference all of this intercompatible acoustic telemetry data that gets submitted to us. Uh, so here's how tracking animals via acoustic telemetry works. Um, first, the animals get fitted internally or externally with a tag or a transmitter that emits a unique ping code. Um, the bigger animals can handle carrying around a transceiver, 
which can both listen for other pings and record them, as well as emit pings of its own. Dedicated listening stations can also be attached to mobile platforms, such as Slocum or Wave Gliders, or fixed in place, either standalone or as part of an independent buoy-borne instrument package, uh, say, for example, oceanographic or meteorological buoys. Uh, the listening devices or receivers can operate independently for a year or for more than five years, depending on which model you pick and the configuration of it. Some of the longer-lived receivers even have acoustic modems that let us recover data from the receiver without having to recover it physically. All right, so we have tags, listening stations, and the data that they collect. At the end of the day, that makes three separate pieces of information that have to come together to give you animal location and space and time in an acoustic telemetry study. You need all three for the data to be meaningful. So first you have receiver metadata, which includes information about which receiver was placed where and when. Uh, this gives you the location context to the detection information that that receiver collects. Without knowing where the listening station was when it heard your tag, its data is not very useful. Then you have the detection data, which is what comes from the receiver when you offload the data from it. There's not a lot of critical info there, the date time, the tag ID that was detected. Uh, we take these in the manufacturer's format to ensure that there's no editing or redacting going on. Uh, and then the tagging metadata, which gives you the biological context about the tag ID that you heard. Uh, which animal was it that you detected? We can associate this back to any supplemental measurements that were taken at the time, species, sex, size, or any sampling that was done on the animal using this metadata. Uh, some of the critical non-biological ones we care about are who was the researcher who tagged the animal, when was the tag implanted, when is its battery expected to die. Um, across the various models of acoustic tags and receivers, there are varying capabilities. So for receivers, a user's biggest concern will often be battery life because that dictates how often you have to recover and service the receiver. Shorter term receivers can last up to a year and the larger ones can go upwards of five years before needing rebattering. And Matt, I think that's Taryn in that photo. Is that right? I think it is. Uh, Ryan Daly, if I'm not mistaken. Is that Ryan Daly? Yeah. Or nice. Stuart Lang, one of them lads up north, yeah. Fantastic. Um, and for tags, though, your concerns are centered around your study species. So what size tag can my species accept as a burden? What is the scale of its movement that I want to capture uh, seasonally, annually, multiple years? How often should my tag wait between pings? From how far away do I need to hear my animals? Uh, the tags will gain battery capacity as they grow in size, and they can be programmed to ping their unique codes with low or high power. This creates a trade-off between range and battery life, and different studies will have different configurations that give them the best chance of answering their questions with the data they'll get back. Uh, so what sorts of questions do researchers look to answer? Uh, you know, a precise understanding of the movement and migratory patterns of key species are very valuable, not only for science and conservation, but for many countries and industries to safeguard economic viability. Um, telemetry can be used to determine the effect of current quotas on underlying populations, to evaluate the use of marine protected areas by the species that were targeted for conservation, to determine the scope and scale of interactions between wild and farmed fish or wild fish and power installations. They can provide the baseline data to help predict future population distributions based on changing environmental conditions. Uh, you can establish the success of habitat rebuilding efforts. And across all of those different questions, they also provide this compelling data set that tells the story of individual animals and how they're navigating local or global geographies. Um, so there are various strategies for deploying receivers uh, in order to best capture different movement patterns across your area of interest. The simplest one is just a single receiver listening opportunistically for animals that pass nearby. The advantage to these is that they're cheap to set up and maintain, particularly as part of a partnership that's already maintaining a mooring in your area of interest. The downside is you don't have a good idea of what's happening between detection events, and you don't always get to pick the exact location of your mooring if it's opportunistic. You could also go with single rows or gates of receivers across a waterway, spacing them close enough together to ensure that you detect animals that are crossing them. In order to get directionality, you could maybe go with a double gate so that your animal can be detected passing each one in succession. So that's what you see with the arrow down south there is a double gate of receivers across the Bredore Lakes. For more fine scale movement, you could also arrange your receivers closer in a two dimensional grid, uh, receivers that are designed to intercommunicate and figure out exact distances and synchronize internal clocks. This can be expensive, but the resulting data allows for position solvers to calculate highly accurate three-dimensional positions for each animal within the grid. This can be the difference between knowing that you're out at the outlet mall and knowing that you're in the third aisle of the Bass Pro Shops. So for these setups, exact information about receiver location, tag programming, and moment-to-moment -moment array configurations becomes even more necessary. Accurate data is always important, but these files find scale movements, it's critical. And sometimes there's scales at which these array configurations would definitely be beneficial, 
uh, you know, creating a long-term time series for a gate that stretches across a certain large-scale waterway or out to a certain shelf break. But there would be a difficult case to make for expenditures at the scale necessary to maintain them for the purposes of answering a single study question. This is one of the ways that we're able to have an impact as OTN uh, to maintain uh, these large-scale lines and arrays as core infrastructure around Canada and in other parts of the world that can tie together many regional projects and programs and provide a basis upon which local projects can build and rely long term. So these are some of the concerns acoustic telemetry practitioners go through when designing their studies. Even though the questions and their solutions can be very different, the intercompatibility across all this equipment asks, acts as a force multiplier for studies that are operating in adjacent waters. Uh, this is well understood by the researchers Regional data sharing networks backstopped by the global OTN data system can work in concert to provide all possible animal detections to telemetry practitioners who are willing to share their data. Uh, we at OTN are literally built from the combined effort of our partner networks and of individual researchers operating in every corner of our global ocean. To date, our partners have tagged and tracked over 74,000 animals across 278 different species, and we've facilitated collaboration between over 1,000 different researchers. Our glider operations, which were meant to characterize the environments that our main listening station lines are deployed in, have now traveled over twice the circumference of the world. So that's how telemetry works, why OTNs are interested in it, uh, and hopefully a primer on why telemetry studies require a good understanding of how well transmitter to receiver interactions are working for their listening stations. So to get a sense of their expected range before a major deployment effort or as part of an ongoing monitoring effort within a deployed receiver array, Range testing gets conducted with tags that are representative of the studies tags, or perhaps across a range of different tag sizes and power levels for operators like OTN who are trying to serve multiple studies with supplementary deployments. In the simplest configuration, these tags can be set up at fixed locations from receivers with specific programming in terms of ping rate and power, and the expected versus actual number of detections can be calculated at each receiver. Alternatively, if you don't have too many receivers, you can design the experiment reverse, where one receiver in a fixed location hears different tags that are set up at different distances to see the detectability range for each different tag and distance at that specific receiver. Um, but what affects the range of an acoustic detection? Uh, the shape of the medium is important. Dropping receivers into holes in the local bathymetry would not be an effective deployment strategy. Uh, high strength currents can create directionality and noise across the water body that's transmitting the acoustic pulses from the transmitter to the receiver. And some of the most interesting places are also the most dynamic in terms of current power, for example, in the Minus Basin. Because sound is reflected, the type of C4 bottom can also matter, and we'll see why that is in a second. Um, but another big factor that, again, I think um, Matt and the champions at the ATAP are very familiar with is the degradation of receiver efficiency over time due to biofouling. And this is some of what you see there. Some of our gear that is meant to be listening stations, but is instead uh, an aggregation device for barnacles. So distance isn't the only concern that affects whether your tag is detected. Uh, we talked about bottom types for a second. The reason we have to be careful to consider these things has to do with the way the tags are transmitting their unique codes to the receiver. For the most popular receiver transmitter configuration, the tags will send a series of pulses on a designated frequency with the temporal gap between the pulses indicating which tag it is that's transmitting. The receiver will decode these gaps into a transmitter ID and store it with a timestamp locally. So this diagram is showing what happens when two tag pulses, or perhaps even the same tag pulse twice, uh, directly and delayed due to reflection or some other reason, can arrive at a receiver at the same time. The sync pings indicate the start of the tag transmission, but both tag pulses can then interleave at the destination and create this code that might possibly resolve to a different ID or not resolve at all. And when this happens, neither of the two real tag codes get recorded. Uh, wild tags are given this random offset value that ensures that two tags in proximity with each other at the, with the same interval programming won't interfere with one another constantly. Uh, range test tags also demand a bit of time to transmit their data into the system, and so they introduce this moment of noise here and there within the array. So for that reason, we can't run range tests uh, at extremely short intervals. So what are some of the questions that we can answer with range testing? Uh, most importantly, you can say what your expected range should be for a receiver. Uh, this impacts things like the distance between the receivers in gate systems, the potential location error at a single point detection, and the effectiveness of the fine scale positioning systems. If I then combine range tests with conditions that I believe are driving this drop in efficiency, for example, ocean physics like freshwater lenses and refraction, ocean noise, the reflection off of a hard bottom, I can start to say things about other locations before I begin to drop my equipment there. And so Jake Brownscomb's paper in Methods in Ecology and Evolution 
talks about using what you know about your study area to evaluate new potential receiver positions based on what you see in your range tests. And so that brings us to today's update. Uh, using Meridian's CADLU package, we can go and fetch oceanographic data about our study area or provide our own data. Then we can apply the acoustic tracking toolkit that's been developed by Stephen Bergner's lab at Simon Fraser U. And my many thanks to Matthew and to Jillian and everyone who's worked on this project um, to evaluate range test data and the effects of our covariates upon the efficiencies we observe. Uh, once we know what's driving our detection efficiency, we can make better choices about where and how to deploy our listening equipment, benefiting our study and also those of our potential partners. And then there's a link for CADLU down there. Uh, hopefully we'll share this, this uh, presentation around and we'll give you guys a chance to, to follow the links to CADLU and other important packages that Meridian has been releasing. And so with that, I'll take any questions you might have and then I'll yield the floor to Dr. Bergner to give an update on where we're at and where we wanna go next. Cheers. Thanks, John. Uh, um, yeah, so we've got time now for questions. And uh, as you said, uh, the, um, the slides, yes. So we have the recordings that we'll put out in our YouTube channel and then the slides we'll make available through our website as well. So you'll be able to go find those and, and then find that link. Um, <coughs> and I'll drop that link in the chat as well shortly. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions for John now, uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself or you can type in your question or comment in the chat box, which we'll keep an eye on. John, I don't see any questions for you. Um, so well, everyone here is an old pro from the names I'm recognizing. It's good to see some of y'all. Um, so I think we'll just move on to Stephen. Uh, thanks again, John. There may be questions. Maybe Stephen's presentation will, will trigger some questions uh, for you as well. So if you can stick around for the second presentation here too, that, that'd be great. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'll just throw the, the link to Cadlo here in the chat. And meanwhile, Stephen, if, if you're ready with your presentation, then uh, please go ahead and share your screen. Okay. That uh, should have happened just now. Is, is my screen shared? Do you see uh, the first slide? Yep. Yeah, PowerPoint. Looks good. All right. Well, yeah, th thanks, John, uh, for setting the stage for, for this part. Well, I will focus on a more um, detailed effort to, um, yeah, I guess, uh, evolve a tool that, that um, helps practitioners who, who work with uh, field data or who are planning um, acoustic telemetry studies to address uh, the critical problem of um, getting a good understanding of the detection range. Um, you already pointed out the, the difficulties around it and the, and the factors, so I'm not going to take too much time on summarizing that yet again, but um, just a, as a brief entry point here. So on, on the picture on the right, you see an effort to, to uh, place receivers to form a gate, right? Within a narrow, I guess, uh, within a river. And uh, these uh, slightly varying radii of, of circles around them indicate that the detection range um, that um, allows you for a successful um, yeah, detection event of any, uh, any tag that is um, uh, attached to, to a fish nearby. Um, can, can vary, can um, raise and shrink. And if it gets too small, you might create gaps in this gate and your, your study assumptions that you have a, a full gate there um, uh, might be jeopardized. And um, yeah, we already heard about some of the possible factors that influence this. So water quality at the research site, um, temperature, some of these things can change over time. Weather can change over time. Things like wind that moves waves and, and makes noise biological noise from other animals can be uh, time varying. And um, also an important one is the bottom type um, in the geomorphology that uh, those are factors that are specific to a site, but that don't really uh, have that much temporal dynamics to it. And we are um, in this uh, following, yeah, focus, I guess, um, trying to get a, a better understanding of the temporal variations. Here's just an illustration. Uh, this is from from Vemco, um, one of the manufacturers of um, the equipment for uh, acoustic 
depictions, um, an illustration of how a different bottom type can affect the performance. Dark, deep blue means a good signal to noise ratio, um, means a, a good range. And uh, if you have a rocky uh, surface, uh, you, you get pockets of better reception and uh, as opposed to us. And yeah, they are specific to the research side, can change over time. And the main motivation for um, the type of tool that, that I'm proposing here now is um, that no single model seems to work well under all conditions. So that, that led us um, to um, propose a workflow that, um, yeah, researchers can run on their own desktops, right? These uh, range tests are sometimes data sets that uh, get produced on the side of, uh, of another, of the actual study where you really uh, care about the, the detections animals that are tagged. Um, but uh, so these range test data sets, they may be somewhere around on people's hard disks, but they're not available in a central place. And so um, we thought of bringing the tool to the users and um, make something that works on the desktop. So first of all, um, to, to get an idea of what are the time varying factors, um, the, the procedure is that you have to perform a range test that extends over a longer time, multiple days ideally. Um, and then the second step would be to also collect environmental variables. We already heard about um, the Meridian tool Cadlu that is very well equipped for that. And uh, we're inf interfacing with that. And then uh, comes a step where these data sets are combined, the detection and the uh, time-stamped environmental variables. And here is uh, one key transformation. Is, uh, so one perspective is that you treat each detection event as something that happens at a particular point in time. And you have your data frame or your table that details all of that. Uh, the other perspective is that you group them uh, and then count them as they occur within specific time windows. And uh, for instance, uh, how many detections you have per hour. Uh, and that uh, allows you to calculate a detection rate, get you an idea of um, what the um, yeah, number of missed detections is. And um, for the purpose of further study, you might choose one or the other, but um, we decided to keep both representations around because different visualizations, different ways to investigate might benefit from either the detection event-based view or the, uh, the group uh, window time, time grid view of, of the data. And then um, you can engage in visual analysis. That's uh, something people do when they don't quite know yet what's going on, when they're still trying to form a model. And um, that's uh, ideally what we'd li like to do, um, uh, yeah, practitioners to do on their own desktops, to uh, have their hypotheses of uh, what variables they think are important, and then to get some confirmation visually. And um, what's not currently part of the tool, and that uh, other people who use this tool can then uh, build upon, is to engage in statistical modeling. Uh, so um, take whatever the exploratory data analysis has brought up and, um, and form statistical models or refine the existing models. And ultimately, once you'd have that, so now you, you have a model that goes from different uh, configurations of environmental variables um, to be able to predict a detection rate um, and a detection range uh, thereby as well. Um, you could use that as a predictive model for your field study where you then also collect environmental variables. But at that point, you don't have the, um, the fixed um, detections anymore that the range test provides. Instead, you have um, detections from animals that move. So there's another source of variability. And um, we now uh, yeah, sort of combine the information from the range test and the field study. Um, I think what a range test is, is something I can safely skip right now. The data sources that are available. This is a slide from yeah, one of the presentations of the first uh, round of this workshop uh, when Cadlu was uh, shown. These are the data sources that are already integrated into Cadlu. Uh, it's an open source tool. So anybody who uses it is, and has uh, wishes to include more data, I guess is free to, to add that themselves or to uh, the Meridian team about adding more. but. These are readily available. There's some restrictions on what years you have accessible uh, here, but th these, these things can all only improve over time, really. And uh, the other source of input is you might have your own measurements. You have your own uh, environmental variables that you recorded yourself while conducting the study. Um, if you bring that into a standard form, a CSV file or a NetCDF file, um, that can be loaded as well. So um, our workflow has separate ways of importing and interpolating that. 
onto your um, detection grid, time grid, and then um, tidal timetables is yet another supplementary data source. So if, if you have only um, values of high and low tides that are recorded, you can uh, interpolate them and uh, calculate you know, something that might correlate with water flow speed and um, tidal phase. That's also another variable that you can use then to compare. Um, the uh, tool itself isn't, doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are already some existing approaches. First of all, the two different programming languages that data scientists uh, specialize in, uh, R and Python, uh, have very rich package systems. So we use Python and uh, using Anaconda, you can very uh, easily set up uh, an environment in Python that carries all of the dependencies that you need to run the tool. So it's uh, just a few lines in a shell that you have to type, but you don't need to be an experienced programmer to use it. Environmental variables come from Kadlu, the link is here and in the, the chat as well. And for metadata, um, we are planning to integrate more closely with uh, the Resonate tool that uh, is natively provided by OTN. Currently we have our own uh, loader of the OTN metadata. And metadata carries information such as um, where uh, about the deployment, where are the moorings, the latitudes and longitudes, how deep are the receivers or the uh, range test tags, and um, what else, power levels for the receivers, right, things that come out of the vendor specifications. So all of this is considered metadata that uh, goes along with your detections that you need to make sense of them. And um, now I'm going to switch the screen to uh, go through some portion. So um, when you run uh, Jupyter, this, this is an environment to, to work with Python, Python scripts and to interleave um, cells of, of code with uh, figures that they produce and uh, have some English documentation in between that outline your, your reasoning behind your steps. Um, so there's a short version of this where um, you really just load some pre-made configuration files that you can write. Uh, they're human readable. YAML is a format that doesn't have many curly brackets in parentheses, it's very uh, minimal, just key values, uh, pairs uh, that you can use to specify the settings for your, your study, uh, where the data comes from the files, what you want to uh, obtain from the data sources, then you construct this detections object. And then um, based on the configuration, you can say what visualizations you want and they get um, summarized here. So if I see if I can make this larger, here you see a first a screening where we show um, the, the grid of uh, time that was used to calculate detection rates, it's, it's fine. So it really just displays uh, showing the dis detection rates, uh, the, the ups and downs looks like a time curve here. And um, I grouped it in a way so that for the different receivers in this study that was conducted in Mahone Bay, um, that for one tag, you see uh, the tag being received by different receivers. So it's tag uh, one, three, uh, three, one, 335 shown at different times, uh, shown under different receivers. And you can see that um, different receivers picked it up differently. And then another tag that has a uh, also high power, but is far, the distance from the receiver to the tag is far. So we, we, we go through the metadata and classify whether it's a far or a near distance. We look at the metadata, whether the tag was programmed with high power or low power outputs, and then um, you see that augmented here in the title to get an idea of um, why there could be, here's a longer outage, so that's not quite explained. Um, but um, yeah, so you, you get to just to screen the detection rate as it changes over time. And um, once you're done with that, um, you go into, can go into the data sources and um, automatically download them. I'll let uh, Jillian speak to that in a moment. Um, in fact, yeah, before, before I hand it over to Jillian to talk about this, I'm just going to show you briefly the configuration file. So here, um, there are different uh, nested levels of, um, of settings, right? The reader says where the data comes from and um, that we're going with an OTN standard. Um, if we have other types of uh, shapes that data can come in, we can have other readers here and they're easy to add by just adding one Python function and giving it a name. And here, these are the data sources we use. We have wind speed and wave information. And the tidal times come from these places. And we have bounds and latitude and longitude and uh, time for the study itself. 
And here are some custom data sources that were manually downloaded from somewhere. Um, Kadalu doesn't, um, uh, well, somewhere there, I think it's uh, HICOM data here. Um, but uh, if, if, you're, if Kadalu doesn't have it integrated yet, you might have your own source for it and you can provide these NetCDF files and integrate them like this. And um, yeah, before I go further and look at the resulting visualizations, um, Gillian, would, would you be able to, to speak briefly about the, the data sourcing? Um, and if you want, I can, I can keep presenting and you just drive me to the, the place in the notebook that you want to show or you do your own screen sharing. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I was just thinking in the Cadlu notebook, um, just where we start talking about the, um, the data being loaded in. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about kind of the two two different kinds of environmental data. So one is coming from Kedlu, and the second is um, that custom that custom data source that Stephen had mentioned. Um, so currently, um, we've seen kind of this source map from Kedlu before. We saw that in the PowerPoints earlier. But essentially, what it's saying is just these are the data sources available, and these are the variables, um, the environmental variables that those data sources can provide us. Um, so then if you scroll up, Stephen, mm -hmm. just to where we read in Kedlu data, I'll give a little bit of kind of a behind the scenes understanding of what's going on. Um, the notebook that Stephen's in right now is just a little more detailed than the brief notebook. Um, but essentially the first thing that needs to be done when reading in Kedlu data is to define what sources we wanna actually use. So for us, this has been defined within the configuration file already. Um, but you can still do it within Python if that's kind of the area that you're most familiar. Um, you just have to define all the variables and tell um, within a dictionary object, say which uh, source that's going to come from. And that lives in the sources in the sources variable um, that's just at the bottom of the screen there. So once you've defined the sources that you want to get, you actually have to tell Kadlu kind of where you want to retrieve those sources for. Um, yeah, so if we just look at the sources. Oh, I probably have to run. It's okay. I'll keep yeah. talking. Okay. Um, once we actually define what the sources are, so we want uh, wave height, wind direction, those kinds of things um, coming from, in this case, we're going to be looking at era 5. Um, then you have to say what the boundaries are. So this is kind of built off of Kadlu once again. Um, and the boundaries are both time and space. So you have to include a start date and an end date. So there'd be the same dates as your range test, typically, um, as well as kind of northeast, southwest boundaries, and finally a top and bottom uh, depth that you're interested in. And then once you have those boundaries defined, um, you can go ahead and read in, you, we use Kedlu's functionality to read in um, Oh yeah, so there's the bounds that Stephen has up on screen. Um, as you can see, I've we've chosen to use kind of a latitude. Um, we chose a center point and then uh, had offsets. So said um, from our microphones, go half a degree north, uh, one degree south, and two degrees east and west. I think. Um, so to kind of choose those bounds, uh, one of the things that our tool provides is a way to just plot it plot uh, those boundaries on a map. Um, this is just helpful for understanding exactly where you're grabbing data from, as well as making sure you're not accidentally grabbing data from the Bay of Fundy when you're wanting home bay, for example. Um, and so once you've kind of adjusted and um, moved your boundaries around and found something that you're happy with, um, that's going to find strike a balance between being small enough that you're not you know, downloading terabytes worth of data onto your machine, but also being large enough that you're able to kind of do some interpolation and actually getting some of the environmental variables from um, the data nodes that ERA5 uh, provides, for example, or HICOM. Once you've found that balance, uh, the balance object can be provided into this uh, add Kedlu environmental data function along with the detection uh, data frame and your sources. Um, specification. And what this does is in the back end is it goes and fetches all this environmental data from Kadlu and then does 3D or 4D interpolation. So it does interpolation over latitude, longitude, and time, and optionally over depth as well. And then it's able to assign uh, the values for those environmental variables to each detection event. 
um, or to each detection uh, bin that Stephen had mentioned earlier. And then that's what allows us to do analysis later on to actually see how the detection rate uh, corresponds or can, uh, you know, correlates to other, to the environmental variables that might change over time. And um, finally, the, the map came up that you were talking about that shows mm -hmm. the, the nodes, uh, receiver and tag locations, and then the, uh, the other nodes here, this is where um, Google <coughs> found applicable data sources, um, measurements for these locations that then will be interpolated. Yeah. So it yeah. just, it took a while to rebuild this because other figures were built uh, further down. It wasn't actually the loading of the data that took a long time this time because that only takes a very long time the first time you do it and then it's cached on the disk, right? It was just that the rest of the notebook still had to run. Um, yeah, so you can imagine, I suppose this is a nice visualization, those um, pink dots show where their data nodes uh, exist um, from the source that you're looking at. So in this case, it's era five. Um, so this might allow you to, you know, change it to make sure you're not, you know, perhaps need a few uh, less data nodes that are over land um, and tighten it up a little bit. But then the interpolation that happens in the back end interpolates between those nodes um, to calculate the values at the receiver, at the transmitter, for example. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, so then once that's loaded in, that's kind of how we load in CADLU data. Um, but then the alternative way as well, just because um, CADLU is, you know, uses open source data sets, there's quite often times where as researchers, you may have your own data sets available to you, you've gone out and done the manual collection in your, in your area, um, or you've just kind of come across a data set that isn't supported by CADLU yet. In this case, um, we can read in that custom data using, um, using our tool uh, still, uh, right now, it's set up to read in NetCDF files specifically. And in this case, instead of providing the source map and the boundaries uh, specification, what we provide instead are um, an, the axes to interpolate over and our a file map. And then the, using those two things, which I'll describe super briefly, um, that same 3D or 4D interpolation is done um, to assign those environmental variables to the detections data that we have. Um, so very briefly, I said I don't want to bore you with kind of the details. The file map is similar to the sources in that if you specify what variable um, you want to use or what variable you want to have, um, and then tell, you know, based on, yes, exactly. So salinity bottom is a variable you want to include in your data set, and that that variable can be read from this bottom underscore sal underscore you know, so on net CDF file. And so the file map, that's all it is. It just says what variables and where to find that data. And then the axes to interpolate um, actually provide those four different axes. So it just tells, um, tells us that we're interpolating over latitude, longitude, and time, and then optionally depth as well. Yeah, precisely. And then by providing those into the function, the interpolation is done for us. You just have to actually tell the function um, what you're going to be interpolating over. And then once you've, once the interpolation has been done, once you've loaded in that data, um, so even if you scroll right to the end of that table, um, or end being to the right of the table. Yeah, okay. I guess you want to then, see the column names. So. Yeah, exactly then those new environmental variables um, you can see have been added. So in this case, we have um, environmental variables like salinity, water V, um, water temp, all have come from our custom data set. Whereas wind V, wind uh, UV, some wave heights um, have come from CADLU. And with this, then once we have this entire environmental uh, environmental data set, integrated environmental data with our detections data, then some visual analysis can be done on top of this. Um, right now, we have focused primarily on CADLU and NetCDF files, but also kind of wanting to expand this out to make it easier for new, uh, like CSVs, um, other kinds of formats that might be typical, uh, to be able to integrate those in here as well to kind of bolster that ability to do some visual analytics. Um, but I'll pass that back over to Stephen to walk us through the, the title data and the visual analytics piece. Sounds good. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, so for title data, I already mentioned that <clears throat> high and low tide 
heights and times can come out of a table. Um, that's just what was available here for this historical study. We were able to obtain that a few years after the fact, and then uh, use an interpolation with cosines um, to give some reasonable uh, in, yeah, estimates of, of heights in between. And then um, this red zigzag line here uh, is, is a phase uh, that indicates where in the tidal cycle you are. So here it's a T and then it, uh, later on we use something uh, it's called T2 that goes from zero to two when uh, you make your way from one high tide to the next high tide and uh, T is one when you're at the low tide point. So it, it's kind of a, a, a time that can be delayed or uh, accelerated depending on how the tides um, uh, vary. And here, so this, this detailed code of like how the plots are produced is really not necessary to look at. Um, in, the, in the short version of the notebook, this, is, this whole thing is just one line and the configuration of which plots you want to actually study is just part of the YAML file where you, you say what you want to see, but you just show the details here and so say it's customizable. And now you get to see a, a detailed view for each particular um, tag and receiver combination. And uh, up here you see just uh, time curves superimposed over the, the duration of the study. And um, water velocity is compared against detection rate to see whether the ups and downs have any relation uh, to each other, whether uh, increases in water velocity may explain decreases in uh, detection rate. And here in this particular uh, time, whether my mouse is on in the center of the screen, you actually get an indication that velocity uh, increases is, is high, higher flow speeds and, um, and detection rate decays to zero. So there's, there's a hint that this is actually, there's actually a relationship. And um, these plots here, there are uh, this T2 variable that I mentioned that tells you where in the tidal cycle you are. Um, and then uh, water velocity is shown and detection count, which is uh, something that's also related to a detection rate um, uh, on top of the, the tidal cycle. And this can only be produced with the event-based uh, data because the time bins where you have like one measurement per hour, um, you wouldn't get that fine of a transition in a shape. Uh, you get wouldn't get as much uh, details. And uh, it looks like it's only one tidal cycle, but it's actually uh, all of the tidal cycles that the study uh, went over uh, uh, aggregated into one view. So what you're seeing here, these values of um, water velocity or detection count are averages over um, all, all of uh, adjacent uh, tides that are in the same part. So the value you see at zero and at two is uh, the state that usually had at uh, high tide. And I guess between high and low tide you get uh, parts where potentially the, the water flow speed uh, increases which is actually visible here at around 1.5, you, you get to see that. Um, this is yet another just time series plot. The plot here on the right is, is uh, interesting as well. It's a scatter plot of detection rate versus uh, water velocity again. I'm just focusing on that variable for now. For this particular tag, the, the functional re there's, there's no conclusive relationship. In fact, it looks like as if there's almost none. But um, so this is for a, a far, spacing of a tag and receiver and high power. Um, here uh, you get to see that for um, low water velocities, detection rates tend to be higher. And, um, and here also you get to see that uh, the variation of detection rate, well, is kind of constant. Let, let me drive us to one other example. Here we get to see that uh, high detection rates occur at low water velocity and then at higher water velocity, they tend to drop. And um, it, it makes somewhat of a case for visual analysis because if there was a clear correlation, like a, a very sharp uh, relationship between uh, increased water velocity means, um, it would be easier to, to fit just to just say, yeah, we, we build a linear model for this uh, relationship. But um, uh, the reality is, as it's shown here, it shows that the uh, the situation is a bit more complex. I don't quite like these plots. Let me see if I have a better version in the other notebook. Um, one second, so it builds up. Yeah, so we get to see here, for instance, we get to see that the detection rate drops as uh, water velocity increases. And this can be done uh, by looking at other environmental variables as well. And a summary 
over all of the variables is visible here in the scatter plot matrix, or uh, not in a co correlation matrix, or we just display the different environmental variables correlate with each other positively or negatively, or a neutral is uh, signified by a white color. And um, one of them is also a detection rate. Yeah, so that's something we're still working out. And after this, so uh, running the notebook up to here, you have this uh, data frame that allows you to study relationships of different variables and explore uh, your own hypothesis. We have this in, in a notebook setting. Um, there is an alternative way to, to um, make your way all the way to here from your detections data to uh, being able to do a visual analysis. And that is um, through something that's slightly more packaged as, a, as an app. We're um, exploring the use of Streamlit here right now. That's another Python library to implement this. I'm, I'm wondering, Samir, this is uh, our RA who's, who's working on this. I'm wondering if you're on and able to briefly demo this? Are you, are you oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Hi, Stephen. Hi, hi everyone. Yeah, I'll, I'll just share my screen really quick if you guys don't mind. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Samir, I think Stephen might need to unshare his screen. Oh, okay. Unshare, which I will do now. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Right now, can you guys see my screen? I did click stop sharing, but somehow um, my system is slow catching up. Yeah, we're still, uh, we still have Steven's uh, screen uh, as far as I can tell here. And it's, and it's stuck here. Well, if this is too risky now to, to switch, um, maybe we uh, wrap it up, bring this presentation to an end, and then um, we optionally um, switch over to, to Samir. Yeah, I think let's do uh, that. Yeah. Also, in the interest of time, I think. Uh, yeah, let's just do that. Idea. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, here's just a final page with some links. Um, here's a, a list of uh, many of the useful tools that the Meridian team is, is working on. Um, Cadlo is one of them, and uh, the acoustic tracking tool is a, a to be a soon published one. So, it doesn't really have a public URL yet, and you can also not access the source code just yet, but that that's uh, gonna be possible in uh, the next uh, week or two. So um, it's essentially ready. Um, there's an in intermediate place to show the documentation and um, there are quite some details there to see about the, the API and the different, the different functions that are available for the different stages of the processing and um, this project page. So yeah, thank you for your attention. And um, I'll open the floor for some questions. Thanks, Stephen. <clears throat> Thanks, Jillian, for uh, walking us through this uh, this workflow that you've developed and uh, and the code that you've uh, implemented. Um, as as before, uh, just to remind you that you can ask questions. If if this triggered any questions or thoughts, comments, you can un you should be able to unmute yourself, or you can um, just type your comment or question in the chat. Maybe also worth um, highlighting that, um, as Stephen mentioned, this is work in progress. So you have any suggestions for Stephen and Jillian where to take this next, then uh, there's a chance here to uh, influence the continued development of this software package. One other thing to note as well, um, I know that uh, quite a few uh, people out there from the biology realm at least um, do most of their analysis in R these days. So um, one of the things that we are also exploring is the use of something called reticulate. Um, I'm not sure whether you guys are familiar with that or not, but Steven's done some playing around with that as a way to use Python libraries within the R ecosystem. So you can do everything in R, um, but still actually be able to import and use the functionality from a Python library like the acoustic tracking toolkit or even like Kedlu potentially. 
Um, so I haven't done a lot of playing around with that, but wanted to point that out um, in case people uh, on the call are particular R users and uh, not making the transition into Python anytime soon. Yeah, if that's going to be your killer feature, this is a great time to tell us um, that we you need to see us in R if you're going to pick us into your workflow. Yeah. Julian, okay. Stephen, I was just scrolling through the chat and uh, there was a comment earlier from, I don't know if you saw it from, from Adam. Um, he was asking about mobile receivers. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that yes. as, a, as a possible I extension. It, it uh, all that's needed there is that your metadata, so the information of where that uh, mobile receiver is placed, right, uh, is going to be time varying as well. But it can, I mean, right now the, the, the column that carries the latitude longitude information is full of constant values. So that would be time varying. And then when we take our environmental data sources and to interpolate it onto that, we will just perform the interpolation for the coordinates you give. So that, that should work rather smoothly. Um, we just haven't been able to try that yet. Uh, Adam is uh, one of the people who would have a data set potentially for us to to take on, to try that on. So I think uh, we mm. might go after him yeah. for uh, something to play with in the near future. Yeah, that'd be great. So that would, yeah, that would be very nice. And like uh, without data, it's, uh, it's hard to uh, make progress. As soon as we have data, then uh, it's a different uh, situation altogether. Yes, and it's also actually helping with one of our main points that I had on a slide early on, that no model works in, in all different uh, environments, right? And so, of course, we need to also do this for more than one range test to uh, study how these factors that we now discover to be relevant here uh, actually might be different in, in another um, uh, research site, right? So um, we, are, we are working on integrating one or two other range tests at this point. Um, one thing I, I just maybe also felt was worth pointing out uh, um, is, and this relates maybe more to the Cadler package, is that the, the data sets, um, the online data report, repositories that we've identified and brought into Cadlu um, tend to have, these are, many of them are, are uh, global data sets, or, so they're data sets that have, tend to have coarse resolutions. And I, we saw an example of that in the Jupyter Notebook. And so that is still a challenge, I think, is to identify data sets uh, for these individual studies that have the required resolution um, at the scale of these uh, tracking arrays. And so, uh, yeah. So a couple of things to say on that is that if you have a, a physical oceanographic model, that's uh, kind of the, the university in-house model, uh, Dalhousie has Dal Coast. Uh, that is a fine scale model. Its results could be put out in NetCDF format and it would be just another data set as far as this workflow is concerned. Uh, and I think that could be very exciting, not only for collaborations, sorry, not only for getting better data into your range test analysis, but also for collaborations across uh, to the oceanographic community. So I see in the chat that my comment triggered uh, a comment by Christina. Uh, this was exactly what I was hoping for. Um, this sounds interesting. Um, you know, we, we've got what we were able to find and uh, that I'm sure that's not exhaustive of, of what's out there. Uh, this concept uh, is, is not any, I, I hadn't heard about it. it. Does it have an API um, or like, how do you actually get these data? Because that's a, an advantage if, if we can set things up in a way so that the fetching and retrieval of data is fully automated. This is what we've done with other data sources. Is that just Open Canada, Christina? Um, okay, uh, so I don't fetch any of this data myself. I just go to their meetings and use it. Um, I believe they have an API. I can look. I'm always sending people information about this data, th this, this model. So I can go back and find one of these things where I've got all the links to the data mart, but I think if you Google the right words, you get some kind of API that you can use. I just can't remember. I can go and find information for you. But um, so they have uh, like a global model and regional models and then even more high resolution models for the Gulf of St. Lawrence and some parts of Eastern Canada and some parts of Western Canada. And so, or like, you know, Pacific and anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's different from HiCom. And I feel like slightly patriotic in saying we should at least include this huge Canadian collaboration uh, as one of the data sources that it can pull. So if you want, I will find the right info. Yeah, oh, probably. There we go. 
Trying yeah, to some of the sign the, the ones the nice. page at ECCC is a little old. Mm -hmm. Um, so I found some more recent things. Plus, I know all the people who work on it. So who should I send that info to? Ah, uh, it's G ops and re ops. Okay. Yeah, and like in further smaller models, they get tinier all the time. That page is probably out of date compared to what gets discussed in the science roundtable. Okay. I think the challenge with GOPS, REOPS, and also possibly with these smaller models, I'm not sure, is that we need access to a historical archive of all of them, and I'm not sure we can do that programmatically yet. That's true, actually. We've had problems with that as well. Our strategy was to just start saving everything we need going forward, <laughs> um, which is not that good for going to the past. Um, yeah, uh, so if you just Name one person that I'll send, or a couple of people I'll send the info to. You guys can evaluate Oliver. Okay, please I can send do it that. my way at least. Uh, yep. I can make sure to forward it to uh, yeah, uh, Stephen, Jillian. Yeah, but I'd I'd love to be included on that. And they always want more people to use it. And well, like anybody who makes anything oceanographic, we want more people to use it so that then it can become better, right? Yeah. Well, you yeah. If we can make this work, then we will uh, very happily be users of this. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm excited to hear their scales below the reops geops. I've, those are always my gold standard. So, yeah, there's they have some nested models like Gulf of St. Lawrence for sure. I, think, I don't know. Every time I go to a meeting, people are showing off their new model, and then and then a few months later, they're like, and now this stuff is being put into the data mart. So stuff is happening at a startling rate. Fantastic. We are almost uh, at the end here, uh, just being mindful of time. Uh, we have just one or two minutes left, so there's room for one final comment or question, um, if there is any. Nope. Okay. Very well. In that case, I think we'll just wrap up here. Uh, thanks again to John, OTN. Uh, for um, helping us, you know, run this webinar and also just for a, a very um, um, pleasant and, and fruitful collaboration that I hope that we can continue. Um, and thanks to Stephen and Jillian uh, for their presentations. And uh, thanks to everyone for attending. Um, we have been recording this webinar. So in case you want to share it with some of your colleagues, um, it will be available uh, on Meridian's YouTube channel uh, sometime next week, I hope. Uh, I will ask uh, John and Stephen, Jillian to share their presentations with me and I can put them up on Meridian's website. So we'll have the slides up there. And yeah, I think that's it. So thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something and thanks for the input as well. Um, and uh, take care. Yeah, and thanks to you, Oliver, for organizing this. Thanks, Oliver. Can't wait to see what's Thank next. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers.